Okay, so it's never too late. And definitely we're talking all about that today. I've got two scientific studies to share with you that will convince you or at least give you a boost if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, is it really worth it? I'm here to tell you, it really is worth it. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns. Most of all, hope to inspire you. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. And before I dive into this episode, I want to make sure that you realize, well, today is going to be short. So make it a short, brisk walk. This is probably interval training. And I want you to make sure that if you're looking for a longer hike, even if you've heard it before, it might be worth going back to revisit a couple really recent episodes. Episode 492. It's not just about how much protein that you need. So for menopause fitness, it gets more and more important that in your late 40s, definitely in your 50s, even more important in your 60s, and it grows with importance with each passing decade, you're getting enough protein. But it's also what kind of protein. It's also when the protein and understanding how it helps you so that you can understand how very important that is, really important to consider. That again is episode 492. It's not just about how much protein. That's the title. Then there are also two that sandwich that episode. So it's 491 and 493 that are really about the effect of caffeine and hot flashes and the effect of caffeine on fat burning. But that comes back to tie into cortisol levels during menopause and how your cortisol levels will affect your ability to lose weight if indeed that's your goal. If it's not your goal, cortisol can still be a big factor for you because it may be something that impedes your ability to gain lean muscle mass. So two things are important here. Did you know that if you were short shading yourself on calories, you may actually gain strength You could still potentially be able to do that, but you would have a really hard time and probably not much success at all in reality, gaining lean muscle. So if your goal is not just gaining strength, it's actually to boost your metabolism so that you have more lean and less fat, you really need to pay attention to lowering those cortisol levels. But we all do for whatever reasons. We have to avoid that muscle breakdown that will happen if we have cortisol levels out of control. We need proper energy. And if our cortisol levels are too low when they should be higher, that's problematic. So there you go. It's the trilogy that came before this particular episode, episode 491, 492, and 493. And if you're targeting the one that's really about how much protein and a longer hike, that one was 492. You can find them all in the show notes at flipping50.com. That's all words spelled out, no numbers, no spaces. But you can also find all of the podcasts at iTunes or Stitcher, iHeartRadio, wherever you love to listen to podcasts, you'll find us there. So let's take a good look at these two studies and Be prepared if you're listening, and it happens to be mid-November. This is always a really exciting year for those of us who are in fitness because we tend to see other people get more excited, at least at the end of the year. But if you're ahead of the race and you're thinking, you know, I really don't want to go through the holidays gaining weight. I want to go through the holidays feeling good. You want to pay attention to our Black Friday specials and an opportunity to get started sooner and jump the gun. Okay, let's start. Study number one. This is proof it's never too late. 10 years of increasing your physical activity or your exercise after midlife can reduce mortality rate by 32%. Now, that all sounds... uh, kind of sciencey, 
But here's the sexy part. This was published in the British Medical Journal. And this was a great study. We like ones that have at least a thousand subjects, probably carry a little bit more weight when we see that many kind of eyewitness testimonials. There were over 2,000 in this particular study, starting with 50 year olds who were 50 between 1970 and 1973. They were re examined at age 60 and then at 70, 77, and 82. Here are the results. After an increase in physical activity, subjects could not be distinguished on the basis of differences in cardiovascular risk factor profile from those who had always had high activity. Meaning, if you're not active right now and you've got buddies who have exercised religiously for decades, they're that friend, the one who's always active, encouraging you or, or putting aside time and prioritizing their activity level, you can catch up in 10 years. Now, 10 years may seem like, oh my gosh, that's a long time, but really it's that time is going to pass anyway, right? You're going to feel better along the way and be glad that you're doing it. The value of increasing activity rates was similar to that associated with stopping smoking compared to continued smoking. How much of a reality is that? So the message again, it's never too late. If you're thinking I'm 50, is it too late for me? And even if you're thinking I'm 60, I'm 70, I've never really exercised. You know, there are other studies out there that have shown, proven that 90 year olds who've never lifted weights in their lives, even restricted to wheelchairs, could gain strength and lean muscle mass after that ninth decade. So not too late for you. If you're a prove it to me girl, I will have the resource listed in the show notes. But again, that was the British Medical Journal. And that was a study published in 2009. It's not all that new, but somehow we bury those and we get to the bad news. (laughs) Okay. Study number two. Think exercise is the fountain of youth? Well, it depends. Yeah, really. All right. So yes, exercise can turn back the clock. And I'm going to be talking about that really all month for for a few weeks. I'm really going to dive deep into how it turns back the clock on something called mitochondria, your energy production storehouses, how it turns back the clock on muscle, on bone, on brain health, and so much more. But collectively, this was what we found in a 2019 study in the Journal of Aging offers proof that you've got to eat to win. So definitely resistance training offers some benefits, but there's some news that follows that. I've shared numerous studies here, blogs, podcasts, about the ability to reverse the expression of 179 genes that are associated with aging and reverse mortality rate as you age and so much more with a it's never too late message. And yet there is this little detail. Lifting weights, and I mean properly to muscular fatigue, is step one. But you must have the presence of adequate nutrition, adequate protein to carry out the mission of younger, stronger, leaner that resistance training has. So a comparison of low protein after resistance training versus high protein consumed after resistance training found that without high protein, there was no reverse aging effect in the muscle after strength training. Quote unquote, regeneration of muscle occurs only with high protein availability after resistance exercise. For older adults, the amount of protein required to hit the high protein threshold increases. That little bit of cottage cheese or yogurt after, although yes, have protein in them, it's not high enough alone. And remember, dairy may increase inflammation instead of halting it, which is the purpose of taking in protein post-resistance training. 
and that means it'll sabotage your results. So what are some good ideas? What is high protein? I'm also going to be talking about that in the coming weeks. So watch social media. If you're on Instagram, follow me there. It's at flipping five zero TV. Likewise, on Facebook, we'll share some of it. We try not to double dip. We know that that if you're on Instagram, you don't need to see it twice on Instagram and Facebook. But let me give you some ideas of what are high protein and high quality foods. So high quality, high protein foods will generally be animal. And generally, we can say that things that are wild, like bison and venison and elk and boar is another one. I can't say I've tried that. Venison and elk, I have regularly. Bison, I have most regularly. Love it. After I've gone to bison from beef, I really, really prefer bison to the beef flavor. And I think you'll like it too. But it's also just got a little bit lower fat It's generally much more friendly raised and the flavor, again, it's kind of one I love. So you're going to have about five ounces of bison, say if you're having it ground as tacos or you're making a bison burger, about five ounces, which is, you know, a general serving is going to hit about 30 grams of protein, which is what you want. About four ounces of salmon, that's going to be a little bit lower essential amino acid profile, meaning you're not going to have the same amount of high essential amino acids as you would say in the bison or even in the beef or pork, if you were choosing that as you are in fish. So just something to keep in mind. Similarly, chicken or turkey fly somewhere in the middle, pun intended, but I will tell you that of course this is national turkey month, but if you're in the United States anyway. But chicken is sometimes called by my good friend, Terry Cochran, the dirty bird. A little harder to control the way they're raised. But if you're if you're very careful, you know the chicken's name, you know how it was raised, you know that it was friendly, no hormones, no antibiotics, and had plenty of space, which is typically the problem with chicken. You you may be safe, but you may not want to. So many families do chicken and then chicken and then chicken and chicken. So you may want to look at another default. Fish is a great option, but red meat is really coming back into vogue. And there are lower fat, high protein sources where the value of that food that you eat You can eat fewer calories to get as much or more protein when you eat high quality proteins. And that's really what we're after. The same isn't true, no judgment zone here, of vegan and vegetarian options. So if you've got to choose your beans and your brown rice together, your caloric intake just went up tremendously. But let's say this, the amount of food, the volume of food is one thing. So the amount of food that you would have to eat to take in 30 grams of protein between beans and rice combinations is probably a colossal amount of food. But even if we could do that, we wouldn't get too full, too fast. The problem would be that the essential amino acid profile still is lower. 30 grams of animal protein versus 30 grams of plant protein has a much higher essential amino acid profile, meaning all of those nine essentials you've got to take in, there are more of each of them in the animal protein than there would be in the plant protein. So at the end of the day, even if you took in the same number of grams in a vegan or vegetarian style eating program, the amount of essential amino acids that you took in would not be as high. Something to consider. So there there are ways to get yourself some help and boost that by ingesting more protein shakes. But again, usually that's not the answer because you're already too full. There's a lot of fiber in all protein sources that are plant-based. So an essential amino acid supplement may be an option. And I will link in the show notes to... Uh, the one that I take and use, not all the time. So my goal is always to food first if I can get it in. 
But, you know, it's not always possible to get in four meals of 30 to 40 grams of protein. And it is an option for me to get in all that I can through food, still have a little reduced uh, caloric intake. So I've got some caloric deficit while I'm taking in all the protein if I supplement with essential amino acids. But we can't necessarily say, okay, well, their cells my problem. I'm just going to take it in through all the essential amino acid supplements. Food first is always better. You get much needed micronutrients in those other foods, and you don't get that with the essential amino acids. We've got to have the whole engine firing. So be thinking consciously that, you know, if you're looking for shortcuts in ways that you don't have to eat, thinking that that's a win, it's just default habit gravity in your thoughts, considering that if you eat less or starve, that you will lose weight faster. That's going to backfire on you in midlife. So eating well, eating to satiety with protein and fiber but yet reaching that quota of essential amino acids is really necessary. So there you have it, short and sweet today. That is just two studies, and I'll be sharing so much more in the coming weeks to get you prepared mentally for investing some time in this busy, busy season in taking good care of yourself with short, high-intensity interval training with short to medium to long, depending on what you have for strength training workouts. and the recovery that you need between. So I look forward to hearing your questions if you've got them, comments if you've got them, and you can find us, Flipping 50 podcast listeners, Flipping 50 TV show viewers, and YouTube channel subscribers, all on Facebook at the Flipping 50 Insiders Group. Great place for you to ask your questions of me, of coaches, and provide me with questions that I may use here on the Flipping 50 podcast. I'll put that link in the show notes. That show notes will be at flipping50.com forward slash never too late. So what are you waiting for? Let's start Flipping 50 today.